Chairman, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here uh, and also to be giving another talk alongside Eric. Uh, we, we come at the, the topic from slightly different angles, so hopefully you'll find that the, the information that, that we give you uh, doesn't really overlap, but is, is uh, quite complementary. And what I'd like to do this morning is very briefly look at uh, the extent of genetic variability in trout, and then go on to consider why that variability is important, and how we should manage and conserve it. And I look in particular at one detrimental aspect, that is the genetic impact of supplemental stocking with, with domesticated trout. But when I'm talking about trout, I'm referring, of course, to salmon trout, as opposed to rainbow trout and the other Oncorhynchus uh, trouts of North America. Now, there are many common names used for brown trout, uh, for, for trout, brown sea, lake, all, all of the rest of it. There's no really one uh, good, all-encompassing name, uh, that which is why I'm referring to it as salmon trout. Now, the native range of trout is from Iceland and Bering Sea in the north down to the Atlas Mountains of North Africa and eastwards to the Caspian and Aral Sea drainages in Iran and Afghanistan. And, of course, trout have been widely introduced to North America and to the southern hemisphere uh, where many countries have taken it as, the, as their own, and uh, uh, New Zealand regards itself as the, the capital of uh, brown trout fishing, rather than anywhere in the, the native range, surprisingly. So how do we study genetic variability in trout? There are three main ways. We can look at the, the features of the trout, the coloration, the body form, life history characteristics, and so forth, as we can see them on the trout, that is the phenotypic characteristics. We can carry out experiments, and I'll come to saying a little bit more about that in a moment. And the third way is to directly examine the genes through DNA and protein studies. And techniques in this area have advanced very rapidly over the, the recent years, and it's now possible to examine directly several thousand different genes. Perhaps the most obvious indication of genetic variation in trout is variation in colour and external body structure. And we have at the, the top here the, the marble trout of the Adriatic, this black banded one from the, the Rhone, very interesting soft mouth trout again from the Adriatic, this one from Turkey with the large black spots on the body. Uh, two more Mediterranean ones there, this very red spotted one, typical of, of Corsica. And going to Norway, you have this one with very fine spots on the body. In fact, this is a simple uh, genetic variant controlled by a, a single gene. And occasionally, uh, in, in one river system in Norway, a marble-type trout uh, appears as well, which looks like the Adriatic marble trout, uh, but has no genetic relationship to it. <coughs> Here are two from, that lived together in a lake in Iceland. When I was first sent the picture of the one on top here, I didn't believe it, it was a trout. It looked, uh, if anything, to be a char or a trout-char hybrid. But all of our genetic tests show, in fact, that it is, a, it is a pure trout. And these two coexist in the same lake. Coming closer to home, uh, a couple of Scottish ones there. Two further Scottish ones, again quite different in appearance. And two from the uh, large western lakes in, in Ireland. And as well as difference in coloration in trout from different waters, we can also in some cases have different types coexisting within the same water body. 
and increasingly examples of this are uh, being found. Perhaps one of the best known examples is from Loch Melvin, uh, up here in northwestern Ireland, and we have these three very different looking trout. The Gillaroo at the top, the Sonic in the middle, and the Ferox at the, the bottom. And these have been known for uh, well over 150, close to 200 years, uh, and there are many accounts of them. And even though these three types live together in this one relatively small lake, they don't interbreed. Because the Gillaroo spawns in the outlet river from the lake down to the sea. The Sonachan spawn in the, the main inflowing rivers. And the Ferox spawns in a deeper part in what is typically an Atlantic salmon spawning area in, in this uh, large river here. And of course, trout, like all salmonids, have a very precise homing to the area in which they themselves were born when it comes to spawning. And this precise native homing means that these three types don't mix on the spawning grounds and therefore they, they don't interbreed, even though they're mixing around when they're, they're feeding within the, within the lake. <coughs> Just to show that, in fact, the, the color Asian differences are, in fact, genetically determined. Some years ago, we stripped the eggs from Gilleru and Sonic and hatched them out in the hatchery and put them out into some small lakes uh, in the university grounds in one of the forest parks, a hundred miles from, from Melvin. And you can see here that you still have this red spotting on the, on the Gilleru and you still have the black spotting, and typically this elongate black pectoral fin that is typical of the, the sonophon. So these coloration characteristics are maintained even in a totally different environment. <clears throat> All of this coloration and other variation has led to the description of well over a hundred different species of trout over the past couple of hundred years. The most recent account of this handbook of European freshwater fishes a few years ago lists 27 uh, potential species. But I think getting into it, an argument as to how many species that there are is really somewhat sterile. Because you, you can argue for a long time and really not reach any conclusions because different people view species in different ways. And really the important point is to recognize the genetic variation that exists within and among different populations, irrespective of what particular names we put in those, whether we just call them populations, species, evolutionary, evolutionarily significant units as in North America, or, or whatever. Now, of course, some of the coloration differences I showed there are directly genetic, but most coloration differences are a product of both the genetic makeup and the environment in which the individual develops, giving the overall phenotype, controlled by multiple genes and by the environment, what is referred to as a, a, quantitative, a quantitative trait. And there are other examples of quantitative trait, for example, survival under different environmental conditions, uh, growth rate, and particularly the maximum size that a fish will reach, and feeding preferences are all a combination of genetic and environmental influences. Most aspects of migration and of reproduction and development of the young, as well as disease and parasite resistance, are again quantitative characters. As indeed is whether an individual trout becomes a sea trout or stays within fresh water. And this is a particular type of trait known as a threshold quantitative trait. Again, it's got both genetic and environmental influences, and it occurs when the combination of the two exceeds a certain threshold value. 